that was definitely a mistake because the team was, uh, you know, we, we were kind of losing a bit of traction in the market where we were really the market leader, subscription analytics, that our engineers were working on stuff unrelated to subscription analytics. And so after, I think, I think about six months of work, we decide, I just said, okay, this is like not good. We're going to be, you know, bad at two different things <laughs> instead of really good at one thing. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 154 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host, Rohit Bhargava, and each week I interview successful founders, investors, and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they you succeed, and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. Before we get into this episode, just a quick note from me. So it's been a little while since I published the last episode of this podcast, and that's because Melbourne's been in lockdown. And to be honest, I need a little bit of a break. But I hope that those of you that are based in Melbourne or Sydney or listening around the world that have been facing restrictions and lockdowns over the last few weeks, I hope that you're hanging in there and coping okay with everything. And secondly, in case you missed it, I launched a new newsletter called Playbook Deal Flow. One of the things that I absolutely love doing is joining the dots. And that's exactly what this newsletter is designed to do. It's all about bridging the gap and supercharging the connections between startups and VCs and angel investors. So if you're a startup or an investor and looking to connect, or if you just want more information, head over to playbookdealflow.substack.com for more details. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get into this episode. And I am delighted to have Nick Franklin, the founder and CEO of Chartmogul as my guest for this episode. Chartmogul is the world's leading subscription analytics platform for SaaS businesses. And Nick has taken a really unique approach in building the business. He launched Chartmogul in 2014 as a solo founder and since then has built a globally distributed team of 57 across three offices in Toronto, Berlin and Seoul. And despite having spent over $20 million in building the platform and the business, Nick has not raised external capital for the last four years. As you can imagine, we covered a wide range of topics in this interview, including a deep dive into SaaS metrics for startups, why Nick decided to fund strap the business, why Nick holds not just the CEO, but also the head of product role in the company, Chartmogul's approach to their pricing strategy and why they introduced a free tier, and much more. Without further ado, here is my interview with Nick Franklin. Hi, Nick. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Hi, hey, Rowett. Nice to uh, be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. No problem at all. Um, and Nick, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what brings you here today? I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Chartmogul. Chartmogul is a SaaS business and we provide subscription analytics reporting uh, to other SaaS businesses and other subscription businesses. So that might be a B2B SaaS or a mobile app subscription, a bunch of companies that you know maybe people have heard of. Um, and, uh, some, you know, some, some smaller. So yeah. And we, we've been in business for seven years now. I think our seventh year anniversary is coming up in two weeks time. Congratulations. And, uh, yo, thanks. <laughs> yeah. It's always like keeping the, it's like first job, right. Of, of the CEOs that make sure you don't run out of money. So that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. So we, we built this, this nice business. We're about 57 people right now. Uh, we distribute across the world. We've got three offices. I'm here in Seoul. We have office in Berlin and Toronto as well. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, there you go. That's sort of brief, some brief overview, but we'll, I guess we'll get more into it as you, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously there's so much that I want to dive into. Um, you know, Chartmogul is is such a great product and, and obviously we'll kind of dive into some of the things there as well. But uh, just going back to the start of your journey about seven years ago now, um, sure. I believe that you were at, at Zendesk when sort of the first idea of, of Chartmogul first came about. Do you want to share a little bit about the story of, of how that how that first came about? Yeah, right. I mean, so... I guess let's go back even further before Zendesk. I, I, I was lucky to find, I guess, my sort of passion uh, or one of my passions or, you know, uh, relatively early in my career, I was working at a company in Cambridge called True Knowledge, which actually got acquired by Amazon and became Amazon Alexa. So it's like a question answering service. Um, and I was, I was working in product there and I really enjoyed it. And I, I really liked designing product UI, thinking about how features should work. Um, but I joined Zendesk because I, you know, it was, it was kind of a better, a better company in a way it was on a, it was on a exciting trajectory. 
uh, on their commercial side. So setting up sales and support teams, doing sales and support myself. Um, I did that for five years so I was, I was kind of head of the European region and then I was head of the Asian region, actually the Asia region minus Australia and New Zealand. So I, I never covered Australia and New Zealand myself, but uh, I covered all the other, all the rest of Asia Pacific for, for Zendesk. Um, and so during that time when I was kind of on the commercial side, we had some, we built some dashboards to measure MRR growth, customer wins, like kind of CRM and, and, and subscription revenue dashboards. And it was quite addictive to keep checking these because you know my my comp structure <laughs> was was dependent on those charts hitting certain milestones, I guess, on revenue, and and also my boss was checking those at the time was checking you know the global dashboard. I was checking the Asia dashboard because you know his comp was dependent on the global revenue number. Mine was so on the Asian revenue number. So, but these the user experience it wasn't really great. wasn't real time. And you, you kind of have to check the dashboard and try to remember how it was in the morning because you're like, has something changed? I'm not quite sure. I think that was lower in the morning. You know, so there was, there was always kind of, it, there wasn't, it wasn't really, it was kind of standard BI stuff that hadn't really been designed for subscription business. So I, I just felt like I was working here at Zendesk where the whole thing was like, the whole mantra was like, we're making business software beautifully simple, nice design, uh, you know, versus this old type of software, which was, overly complex and didn't have any designers on staff or whatever. Uh, so I just thought like, when it come to the business intelligence and analytics software we're using, it just didn't seem to have that kind of SaaS Zendesk style polish to it. And I just felt, okay, maybe this is an area of software that hasn't yet been SaaS SaaSified and hasn't, hasn't had nice design and, and user experience brought to it yet. So that's kind of where the idea came. I thought, you know, if I, if I build an analytics product that's really designed for subscription businesses, for helping them measure their subscription revenue and their subscription business, then you know I could build something that's really nicely productized, has a nice user experience and good design and all those kind of things. And um, so that's kind of where the idea came from. Yeah. yeah. And, and really kind of going out and scratching your own itch. Nick, you know, one of the things like listeners of the podcast come through sort of the various stages of the founder journey, but I'm sure that there are a number of listeners that are probably in similar shoes to what you were in seven years ago, where they've got a great idea, um, currently working within a particular company and yeah. are sort of starting the, the building blocks of building that. And um, from what I understand, you also had, uh, you know, were working on the idea and the product for a little while, but you were um, pushed into quitting and going full time with the company a little bit earlier than you had planned. Um, do you want to share a little bit about the, the story as well behind that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the first point you made about founders being in a company and then seeing some need and then leaving to start their own thing, that story I've seen play out like hundreds of times probably now over the last few years among people I know or people I've got to know where, yeah, they worked at a company, a big SaaS tech company or any, you know, some kind of company and they see, okay, this, this software they're using internally is being done, isn't very good, or they're, they're doing something using Excel that they can turn into a product or they've built a script to do something and they can productize that. So that's a really cool way you learn about, it's a real, I think it's a very, maybe it's a very safe journey, <laughs> you know, as, 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 as safe as doing a, as conservative as founder journeys go, getting a job in, 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 in a big tech company and then leaving to start your own based on some need you've seen. It's, you know, I like to say that, you know, I'm a risk taker, total pirate entrepreneur, but the fact is like a lot of people do this journey. It's not, it's not as crazy as dropping out of college to start your, you know, uh, you know, the next big uh, consumer app or something, which is much more higher risk, right? So anyway, but uh, to, to your other point, um, uh, why did I, so I, I went part-time at, at Zendesk originally to initially to, to kind of put some more, to put some, you know, real time into this. And then, yeah, while I was building, while we were building our first kind of MVP, we noticed that a competitor had launched before us. <laughs> like, oh, damn, this looks very, you know, it's, it looks different, but it's, you know, they're tackling the same problem space um, and they're starting to get traction and, you know, they had open open they were open startups they kept sharing their their numbers I'm like oh damn it every day we're building and we haven't launched anything and I, I was getting i was like getting 
frustrated of not being full time. So I just thought, okay, if I want to, the, the maybe time, the window of opportunity for this idea is running out. Um, and therefore, if I really want to have a go at it, I need to leave and really go full time and go 100% on this now. But I was so surprised. I honestly thought that like measuring month at the time, you know, this is 2014. Um, you know, I had the idea kind of, you know, 2013, 2014. And the idea that, you know, another person on the other side of the planet would think of the same, like the idea of measuring MRR, mm -hmm. monthly recurring revenue for SaaS businesses using billing data from a subscription billing system. To me, this just seemed like such a niche, like such a, such a random, like a specific idea that like, it wouldn't be something that somebody else would have around the same time or even before. So it's just like, uh, really weird, but then, and then it turned out there was, there was other competitors also working on the same idea as well, you know, so there were a few mm -hmm. launched before us, a few launched after us, but that was really nuts. I just didn't think that would happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's really interesting that you kind of pointed out about risk because I, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the initial focus needs to be going in sort of validating um, the problem space and making sure that there's a big enough need for, for customers in, in that area. And I think, you know, having, if you're at least inside a company and you're sort of seeing a, and identifying a specific problem that is assisting you, chances are that there are other companies like that, but it is very hard to kind of get that market validation. I'm just wondering from a, from kind of being in that position seven years ago where you saw that um, competitor launch, um, what were the things that sort of indicated sort of market validation for you? Or I guess, what was that sort of all you needed that someone else was kind of there and, and building up a little bit of traction to kind of give you the confidence um, yourself to, to sort of really go in full time with Chart Noble? Yeah, I mean, well, the, pl the plan was only to stay part time uh, for a short while and then go to full time. Uh, however, it definitely, it, seeing another company get, getting traction sped up the decision making you know it, it was like okay we really have to go all in to now otherwise i miss the opportunity to like become one of the play, you know serious players in this space um so that definitely helped give more urgency and more conviction i think i i had conviction before so one of our developers saw them and like sort of shared it on our on our, on our skype we didn't have it's like skype at the time or something and i was like whoa <laughs> That's annoying, <laughs> but I, 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 I kind of knew like there was probably enough subscription and SaaS businesses where there would be some market for this. I didn't know how big it would be or, or anything like it was just hard. To, it was almost impossible to know. I knew there was just, there was something there and it would be useful to some companies. I didn't, but then seeing another company launch and actually get traction um, was obviously like for me proof enough because I thought, okay, we're actually, it was my belief at that time where well, we're building a better product. We have more, you know, there's some fundamental different, different differences in how we're approaching solving the problem. We think is, is a better way to do it, but it doesn't really matter if you don't have a product in the market. <laughs> so if you can't actually, you know, put it out there. So yeah, definitely helped cement the conviction, I guess, but probably most founders might not have the same situation, you know, if they're working mm -hmm. on a new idea, um, they might not have that same situation happen where they you know, another startup comes along with a very, in a very similar market with a very similar product, um, you know, and, and it's openly sharing their traction as well, their revenue numbers in real time. So. Yeah. I, I think especially, you know, as you mentioned, you thought that this was such a, such a niche problem area to attack and you saw, a number of competitor, sorry, a competitor launch beforehand. And obviously, as you mentioned, a couple of competitors launch afterwards as well. I guess having gone into the business full-time and really sort of focusing on, on growing Chart Mogul, um, how do you sort of think about or approach differentiation from a from like a product or a business perspective to stand out from your other competitors? Yeah, so most of the other competitors have since closed down um, or gone they just stayed very small or they might not, they might, if they're still around, they're not um, so significant. Only really three players, us included, became, you know, million dollar plus revenue startups. So had, had some, had some actual real traction. Um, how did we differentiate? I think for us, it was a number of things. The main thing I think was focus on product and try and win by just having the best product. 
Um, so that's how we decided to do it. You know, I think others, and also is to stay focused and that helps having the best product. So some of our, our both our other competitors who emerged as kind of the two, the th three main players in the space of the two others, they had features like email dunning and things like this, which is kind of adjacent to subscription analytics. And we thought actually maybe that belongs in the billing system or not, you know, we're going to really focus on subscription analytics and just try and make sure we have the best product in this space. And so as our competitors added additional adjacent services, like even, even messaging and other, other things like that, we just said, well, if, if we're going to kind of be able to service larger subscription businesses um, and larger SaaS businesses like Pipedrive and other customers of ours, well, we need to go really deep on on what we do well, which is subscription analytics. Because those bigger companies, they have best in breed product for everything. They have best product for customer service, like a Zendesk or whatever. They have a best in breed product for, you know, uh, billing and, and, and for, for messaging, like an intercom or whatever. They, they have like, or, and for CRM, like Salesforce. So they're not gonna, you know, that they would rather we just went really deep on the analytics side and solve that problem really well. Um, so we just put all our focus on that and uh, you know, reinvested mostly in, 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 in engineering um, and product development and design. So, and, and try to just build up really excellent organization, keep the rate of innovation high and just sort of out product our competitors on the subscription analytics side. So that's how we've chosen to mostly yeah, compete against, against them. They also have other things that they're good at. Like, you know, I'd say on some of the marketing stuff, I feel like they, they, they can sometimes be more present than we are, you know, these kind of things. So it's like, you've got to kind of pick your battle, right? It's like your mm -hmm. sales, marketing or product. It's like, I'm kind of product first founder type of person, but I do have some kind of inside sales experience with Zendesk. So kind of playing to my strengths there. Yeah, you know, I think the theme of focus has come up so many times on this podcast from uh, from interviewing founders. You know, I, I know from my own experience as well, as you mentioned, it can be really, really um, difficult with all of these shiny adjacent sort of features that, that you can add onto particular companies, uh, onto your sort of own feature set. And I imagine it's sort of doubly hard when you're seeing other competitors doing that as well. Um, and as you mentioned, it's really important as a founder to be able to, to pick your battles. Um, do you have any advice for founders that are potentially in a similar position in terms of how they, like any particular systems or processes or things that they can do to identify where they should be focusing um, and how to get and retain that focus? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, it's not something I've always done perfectly. We, we started projects or started product lines or whatever, or launched things that were not that were in hindsight a bad idea and outside of our core focus area and turned out to be a bit, big distraction for the team. And, you know, we, we just kind of rolled that stuff back and just, so I think the important thing is to have a clear, a very clear vision for what you're building and like who your target audience is, right? So clearly define target audience. For us, it's, it's like digital subscription businesses uh, between zero and a hundred million dollars in ARR. So if you're a digital, if you're selling monthly gift box deliveries, you know, we have some of those customers, but it's not our core focus. Mm -hmm. And even within digital subscription businesses, we have an even more core, which is like B2B SaaS focus. So B2B SaaS companies are more kind of our core focus than say a mobile consumer subscription business. Although we do have a lot of those customers and we try to service them as best we can. So I think having a very clear definition of what your core target audience is helps you stay focused and then having a clear vision for what the product is. So I think about three years ago, we created this vision of, okay, we're building a subscription analytics platform. Uh, we're building, and, and part of that uh, has two parts to it. One is the, the data platform, which we call subscription data platform. And the other is the analytics kind of analytics features and, and dashboarding tools. So, and we kind of mapped out exactly what components a subscription data platform would need. What, what do we have today? What's missing? What do we need to change, et cetera. And we've just been kind of executing against that roadmap for the past two or three years now, and just staying very, very focused on that. But that was definitely quite a journey to get to that point from kind of 2000 13, 14, yeah, 2014 when we launched to, I, I guess, about 2019, uh, where, we, where we were really 
So it took us maybe four, five, four years or so to get to that level of focus where we knew exactly what we were what we were building, what the category of product we were creating is, what it what things it needs to have to be feature complete, you know, to be a complete solution and who who it's for. So it definitely took us a long time to get to that point. I think if I was to do a, another startup, I'd try to answer those questions first, or at least really early on, because uh, you can save a ton of time and and uh, avoid a ton of distraction uh, if you if you kind of if you get to that place quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, you know, how has that um, sort of evolved for, for ChartMobile over time as well, you know, especially for, for a startup when, you know, you've got this vision of this product or, or this particular problem that you want to solve. But obviously, once you sort of take things into market and as you're growing, you're getting more and more information, and more and more feedback from, from customers. So again, like, you know, I think our listeners would be really curious to sort of understand what has the ChartMogul sort of evolution of that sort of focus look like? And I guess, what, was there a particular tipping point or um, what sort of led to the culmination of you having a, a very, you know, getting to the point of having a very clear... Yeah focus area um, four years in? I think it was maybe um, the realization. So we, the last time we raised funding was four years ago, I believe. Um, and is that right? Yes, about four years ago, a um, bit over four years ago. And for that fundraising round, um, we were like trying to, you know, figure out how do we, how do we make a, a vision for the future where chart mobile can become this you know billion dollar company right and we were like well maybe subscription analytics maybe the subscription economy subscription it's not big enough that maybe there aren't enough businesses that need a product like ours so however what if we extended our product to not just work for subscription business but also work for businesses that have reoccurring revenue as well as recurring revenue reoccurring like you know, Starbucks, people go back to Starbucks all the time. Starbucks, if you have a Starbucks membership card, they track, they're tracking, you know, your purchase habits, these kind of things. They can probably measure your lifetime value. So there's a lot of very, you know, they probably retention and churn rates and stuff like that associated with, with companies that have reoccurring revenue, even though that's not technically a subscription. Um, airlines also, you know, they have a lot of loyalty programs, things like that. Um, so we thought, okay, if we extend to that market, um, you know, which includes also e-commerce and things like that. Um, that will be a huge market, and then we can make a story that Chart Mogul will become this big company. So we raised the we raised some money, and we actually started, you know, building some of these features to make Chart Mogul not just for subscription businesses, but also for transactional businesses, e-commerce businesses, and the like. And that was definitely a mistake because the team was, uh, you know, we, we were kind of losing a bit of traction in the market where we were really the market leader, subscription analytics, that our engineers were working on stuff unrelated to subscription analytics. And so after, I think, I think about six months of work, we decided, I just said, okay, this is like not good. We're going to be, you know, bad at two different things <laughs> instead of really good at one thing. Right. So I, we actually launched what we, what we built and, and it's kind of, those features are still there and it's kind of nice for some of our customers that are subscription businesses that have some transactional revenue. They can act, they actually do appreciate what we built at that time. Um, so it, it's not the end of the world, but definitely at that point, I said, okay, at that point we were kind of saying, okay, Chartmog is going to be for subscription, but also e-commerce and transactional businesses. And that was kind of the vision more, instead of subscription analytics, it was going to become more general revenue analytics. Um, and, and that was definitely a mistake. And I, I definitely kind of pivoted back and said, after, you know, team was getting unhappy, you know, we weren't focused customers were complaining about issues with our product going that weren't going addressed because we were working on features that um, weren't even going to be for them. So we refocused the team and said, okay, forget about that. We need to become uh, focus on what we do well and that 100% of our effort will be on subscription analytics, subscription businesses. And even at that point, I said, let's go even more focused, not just any subscription business, you know, but only digital subscription businesses and a hundred percent and and that we you know we that was about three three or so years ago that we uh you know th three and a half years ago something that we kind of decided okay 100 percent focus laser focus digital subscription businesses b2b SaaS. that's our core market let's just build for that 
and uh, we've been doing that ever since and it's been yeah definitely it's also been our fastest three years for revenue growth and all these kind of things and reduced churn so i think the amount of the amount of resources and 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 people required to attack multiple markets or to support multiple products at the same time is enormous. Uh, and I think we definitely underestimated that. It's not, I mean, obviously companies like Apple, right? They can, or, you know, most big tech companies, they can have all these multiple product lines, right? Um, and I think, I, but I think for a startup, it's hard to know how, how much the, the sh like the, the resources you need to support and build and sell and market multiple product lines is so extreme. Uh, so I think we underestimated that. We've also launched another. We also launched another product called Revenue Recognition, which is like an add-on for our core product. Um, and this was a thing that calculates um, the kind of gap or uh, you know re revenue recognition schedules for using for accounting. Um, now it's not it's not a different market. We were selling it to the same subscription businesses to help them with like compliance, but it is a different department. So it's not the it's not about decision making and business metrics. It's more about accounting and compliance. And that was also, although that did make money, um, and we still have customers using it, and we still ourselves do actually use that product for our own accounting, we still decided to discontinue it. Um, so we, we sunsetting it. Maybe it will still be supported for another year or so, but we don't sell any new licenses of our RevRec revenue recognition add-on, and we stay. Um, purely focused on the subscription analytics. So we've, we've definitely done it twice, I guess, where we, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and uh, I don't think we'll never launch another product or another, you know, thing or, you know, in our, you know as, as we get bigger, but definitely it will be some, it will be at a stage where we can really afford to have an additional product development team, additional resources where it doesn't distract us from, staying number one in the market in our core market. Yeah, I, I think it's such an interesting point. I had uh, Patrick Boylan, who's the CEO of 99designs on the podcast a, a while ago now, and he spoke about sort of very similar uh, product stream that they built up, which was making money, but it was actually pulling them away from their core focus and yeah. was net detrimental for, for the business. So they decided to sunset it, which, you know, can be really, um, really difficult for founders as well, especially if they're seeing a little bit of traction coming in and they're at the very early stages, it can be hard to kind of turn off um, specific yeah. revenue channels as well. Um, yeah. Again, any advice on, you know, how or frameworks that, that founders can use to help them, you know, really decide whether a particular sort of channel or focus is, is not actually the, the right, right sort of approach? For them yeah i mean I, I don't really use frame much frameworks or anything like that i think you know just thinking things through carefully um and trying to think st multiple steps ahead i guess like you know making sure you know making sure you're so we we haven't launched um you know after thinking about e-commerce analytics and not just launching a few features but not really going into that market and then launching RevRec and eventually sunsetting it. We haven't yet done another thing like that where we've just we've just stayed laser focused on subscription analytics. And I think, you know, we've we've had ideas where oh we could do this, we could do that, and we've just decided actually it's better just to stay focused. We're now getting towards seventy people or sixty people, and soon seventy people, you know. But we still have so much more to do in subscription analytics. So it's like we need to kind of before we start thinking, okay, what about building this little adjacent thing? Um, we have to make sure we, we kind of complete the work there and do what our, our existing, making our existing customers happy. I mean, I think if you have extremely low churn with your existing com customers, right? Like negligible churn, it probably means they're already pretty happy with what, you've, what they've already got. So it might give you a little bit of leeway to start experimenting with new stuff. But if you've got, you know, churn of, I don't know, three, four percent a month of your customer base, I think that's pretty much or more. Some, you know, some people have six, seven, eight percent monthly churn. It's pretty extreme. I think if that's the case, uh, you got to fix that, that first. And fixing that means making your product as it stands today, actually solving the problem that it's supposed to solve. Right. So I think the metrics can also help you decide like, OK, is, do we have enough? 
leeway in the metrics, you know, very low churn, which generally indicates people are happy with the product. They're not going to leave if there's not a new feature launched for a while. But yeah, you know, I guess we didn't have that luxury at, at the time. Now our churn is actually very low, but we still want to keep it low and stay focused. So. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, and, and again, um, like the, there's just so many things that I want to pick on, but, you, you know, speaking about metrics, one of the really difficult parts for, for a founder, and at least like I found this through my own journey is you so laser focused that it can be hard for you to sort of understand baselines of what does good look like in, in the context mm. of, you know, SaaS businesses overall. And what yeah. are the things that, you know, what are the type of metrics that I should be focusing on? Obviously everyone is kind of focused on sort of top line MRR growth and all those sort of things. But um, again, from, from your perspective and, you know, considering Chartmogul as a tool as well, um, you know, what are some sort of for early stage founders, what are some metrics or what are some good baselines that they should be aiming for, for their business? Uh, sure. I mean, I think obviously revenue metrics like what Chartmogul provides are, some of them are leading, but a lot of them are um, uh, kind of are not leading indicators. Sorry, a trailing indicators, uh, I mean, of, of success. Um, and they can tell you a lot and help you make decisions, but they're not necessarily giving you the real time, especially if you're very early stage. So you might, you might want to think about, you know, the product usage and engagement metrics um, as being more leading and more North Star metrics. But I think it depends. I mean, you know, a mix of looking at revenue, ARR, MRR, churn rate, customer churn rate, gross net revenue churn rate is, is, is really valuable and, and creates good discipline, of course, but then also looking at engagement and looking at you know, how, how to drive, not necessarily just engagement that's just useless, you know, checking of things, but like actually how to figure out how much value you provide the customer, because that's obviously the, what, the thing that's going to make them pay you. And uh, you, you could have a really addictive app, but people won't pay for it or it's, it's people will cancel it. Um, easily because it doesn't actually provide a, a high value, right? So you've got to figure out a way to measure the value. And then in terms of revenue, I mean, what is a good number? I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if there's a probably to answer for that. I think um, if you're selling to, if you're a SaaS company, you're selling to SMBs, anything anything under 5% monthly churn is, is kind of okay. Obviously, if it's 2, 2% or 3%, um, in that region, that's that's pretty solid on the on the logo churn side. And, and I think the main aim should be if you're selling B2B is is to get the net uh, revenue retention, the, or the net MRR churn rate below zero, so that you know even if you lose some customers, you make up the shortfall from upselling to your existing customers. And then the business just becomes much, much easier to, run and much, much easier to grow because you're not like constantly having to fill a leaky bucket of revenue. Obviously you kind of always want to add new customers, but, uh, and, and you are going to lose some customers. That's just the reality, especially if you sell to SMBs. Man. One of the number one reasons we lose customers is because they get acquired. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, cool. It's nice for the, <laughs> the team. They got acquired, I guess, if that's what they, that's what they wanted. But then oftentimes they're getting acquired by a big business that doesn't want to use the same software stack that the, the, the our customer was using. Um, so you're always going to lose customers. But if you you know if you if you're upselling your existing customer base at a at a rate that's higher than that you're losing revenue from the, the cancellations, then it's much much that that's a, posi a position you should get to as if you can. And I think it's it's usually always possible to get to that position in B two B, not in consumer, of course. Like if Netflix just kept raising the the you know price people would leave <laughs> or whatever you know like there's no it's almost impossible to get to that point in b2c uh but in if, if you're selling to growing businesses that are hiring more people you can charge them for more licenses or if they're increasing their volumes of data you can charge them for more data volume things like that so. one other thing that i want to sort of pick on that you touched on earlier was the fact that you know your last round of funding was about four years ago three or four years ago uh where you raised i believe 3.7 million dollars Ah, so we raised, yeah, just over four years ago in the summer of, of 2018, or maybe 2017, sorry. I think in the summer of 2017, uh, we raised uh, $2.2 million. So we'd raised before that, but in, in aggregate, 
we've raised three point seven million dollars. Yeah. So Got because it. we've raised before that, we'd raised one point five before that. Yeah, and it's it's really sort of interesting as well. Like you, ha- you know, you have multiple different uh, pathways. So you've got sort of founders that get onto uh, the VC and, and the sort of fundraising path and sort of continue that over the life of their business. We've had yeah. several of the podcast guests recently, so companies like Linktree, who gives a crap, uh, as of this week, uh, who have raised, you know, have been bootstrapped for a really long time and who, then have who, then. What did you say? Who gives a crap? Who this gives a, a crap? Company? It's a yeah, they're a, they're a toilet paper brand um, that. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, which which is a subscription toilet paper brand. Uh, they oh, donate fifty percent of their profits as well each year. Uh, awesome. So not not a traditional venture business, but they raised uh, forty one point five million Australian, mm-hmm. um, which is a which is a great outcome for them. Great business, um, doing great things. But uh, you know, again, th- there's kind of that very different approach, which is you know let's bootstrap for a really long time, and then when we're sort of ready to to really sort of use the the revenue for scale, we can do that, and we can generally get much better terms. Really interesting to kind of see Chart Mogul's journey, which is kind of the almost opposite, which is kind of raising up front and then deciding that actually you want to sort of focus on profitability um, of the business. Again, do you want to share a little bit about how potentially that has evolved or, um, you know, I guess what what made you feel like you didn't necessarily need to continue fundraising for the business? I guess it was maybe two or three reasons. Like when I first, when we first launched the business, I thought, you know, my, my whole experience of SaaS was Zendesk and Zendesk did a very traditional path. Um, seven years or eight years from founding to IPO, they raised A round, B round, C round, D round, E round. I think E or D round, D, D or E round was like sixty million dollars from Goldman Sachs, and and then they IPO'd on the on the New York Stock Exchange, and so they raised you know, in total about 80, 80 something million dollars before going public. Times back then, you know, these days people raise like billions of dollars before going public, but that was more normal back then to just raise about eighty million dollars and then go public. So I just thought, you know, that's how it's done, right? That's probably what Char Mogul might do too, right? Um, if we're doing things right. So, but when you get into it, you you, you know, you, you realize that not every market is the same, not every product category is the same. And, you know, we we haven't grown, you know, we've been in business for seven years. We're not at, you know, a hundred million run rate and, and preparing to go public. Um, so, and part of that is, and that I don't believe is anything really to do with the amount of money we raised. It's to do with the market, the product category we're in, um, how we, you know, we're, we're also creating a new category of product subscription analytics. It's, it's, it's not necessarily, there isn't necessarily budget for that. Zendesk was a new category of product in that it, it was the first product to make help desk software easy to use and it was SaaS uh, web-based, but there was existing budget for that because it's mm. the, the worst existing customer support software, but it was on-premise software. It was actually quite expensive. So Zenus was quite quite a good option because uh, we generally just uh, lowered the cost of uh, people buying previously paying for on-premise software. So with us, we're kind of creating a new category. So you also have to kind of change hearts and minds to say, I think Zendesk, a lot of the hearts and minds were like actually getting people to convinced that they have to use, they should use a SaaS sol- solution. In fact, when you call people up, people that were trying, you know, prospects at that time, this is 2009, 2010, they didn't know what SaaS meant. So you have to say like SaaS, that means software as a service. Uh, so they really didn't know. You also say Zendesk and they'll be like, Zen- oh, you're from Sand- SanDisk? Uh, <laughs> no, not SanDisk, not the flash memory drive, <laughs> not the flash memory company, like Zen. Like uh, you know, Zen, like 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 Buddhism, and and then desk, Zen desk, you know. So uh, it was it, it was a different set of challenges for us in terms of funding. I think you know we generate we generate healthy amounts of revenue from our customers, and we reinvest that. And I think that has been fine. I don't think having we've never felt cash strapped, or we don't have enough money to try this or do that. To so I so I'm not quite. It, it just didn't, and I don't think, I think another one of the things is like, well, if you raise 10 or $20 million, what would you do with it, right? That's a good question to ask yourselves, right? And we all, we were like, well, I'm not sure if we can just spend 10 or $20 million on marketing. I'm not sure if that's going to really help us grow. You know, we're not, are we going to get like 10 or $20 million back in, in ARR from spending that? Um, so it was like, how do we, you know, our market is B2B SaaS and, you know, digital subscription businesses, maybe there's 10, 20,000 businesses that fit that profile is having this money going to help us like win those customers over. Um, I d- we didn't felt that it, 
it's not really going to help much. Of course, you know, more money, you can always do something with it, but is it going to be uh, deployed efficiently? And we felt that, you know, sometimes some months we even have trouble spending the money that we do have from revenue growth. You know, if, mm. if we grow MRR by, you know, 10 or 20 or, you know, $30,000 in MRR growth in a month, it's like several employees we could just hire. And it's, it takes a long time to find that many good people anyway. Um, so, yeah, we just never felt that we need to. And yesterday I was actually tweeting out yesterday that we've actually spent, although we've only raised $3.7 million, we've actually spent $20 million uh, building yeah. our business and our product. So we've spent, that's money we've spent. And of course, most of that came from customers. So we've raised money. We raised it from investors and we raised it from customers. <laughs> so it's at the end of the day, it's like, you need money to run and build and grow a business. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. Uh, come, coming from customers in a way is better. Market validation and people buying your product and no, no dilution. <laughs> mm. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like, correct me if I'm wrong, but just kind of thinking about the timelines of something that we discussed earlier in terms of you sort of identifying the focus of not deciding to go into e-commerce and other sort of verticals and really sort of doubling down on, on digital subscription businesses. Did that have any effect in, I guess, how you thought about the market and, and specifically on your sort of fundraising strategy as well? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure if it, if it had a, an impact on our fundraising strategy, but or I, I guess the, the decision not to sort of keep going down the, the venture funding path. Uh, so the decision, I mean, we've never made a, we've never made a definitive decision not to raise more capital. So I think we, you know, we've, we've always kept our my mind open, our minds open to the potential of maybe raising more money if we think we need it, or we think we can deploy it efficiently. And we think it's, and, and it's going to make sense. Um, it, we just never got to that point over the last, since we, la we last raised four years ago, and we just since then didn't get to that point. We're like, okay, now's the time we can totally raise $20 million and deploy that capital in a good way. We just didn't get, and, and, and it's going to be a smart thing to do. So we just didn't get to that point. doesn't mean we're never going to do it, but also the revenue, we don't share revenue publicly, but you can probably guess, you know, it's not negligible with those, six, you know, nearly 60 employees now. It doesn't really make sense to raise small amounts of money, right? It doesn't make, because we, you know, we're at a certain size where to have a, have a meaningful impact on the business, uh, it only really makes sense to raise a you know, relatively significant amount of money, you know, maybe 20 million or, or, or 50 million or you know, some, it doesn't make sense to raise three or four or five million dollars because we can just make that much money ourselves. <laughs> uh, so it's, it was kind of, you know, it's kind of like, and if you're raising those big amounts of money, right, then, you know, usually there's an expectation of, okay, you're going to be able to triple and then triple again and then double and, and kind of, I, you know, get to that uh, 100 million and, uh, and beyond and then go public. And I, I just felt, we, we, we just felt like we're not quite on that, you know, hyper growth journey where I think we're growing very healthily. We're building a great business. We have happy customers, happy employees. That's more important. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, speaking of not necessarily needing small bits of money in a slightly adjacent view is your pricing structure as well, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, again, for, for those listeners that may not be familiar with um, ChartMogul or sort of ChartMogul's pricing, do you want to share um, how that's structured? Sure. Well, I mean, yeah, well, here's a plug. I mean, it's, it, starts, it starts for free. So if, you, if you're a startup with or any kind of business, really with less than $10,000 in monthly recurring revenue, you know, $120,000 in annual revenue, uh, our product is completely free. Uh, so there's no, there's, you don't have to pay anything. And so I recommend if you use Stripe for your billing or Chargebee or Recurly or PayPal or Apple, App Store Connect and Google Play, any of those systems, you can simply create a free account, connect your billing systems and you get a really great uh, dashboard you can do subscription analytics with. Um, and I, I guarantee you'll learn something about your business by doing this uh, and it won't cost you anything. However, yeah, once you do go over 10, 10K MRR, you get like a paywall, basically, like a New York Times style paywall that says, congratulations, <laughs> <laughs> you, you've, you've hit 10, 10K MRR. And yeah, if you do want to keep using the product, you got to pay. 
And the pricing starts at $100. Uh, and then we charge you $25 for every additional $10,000 in MRR that you make. So that works out at 0.25% of revenue. And of course, once you get to sort of five, $10 million in, in, in annual revenue, you qualify for our sort of custom volume, high volume pricing. And so, we, you know, we adopted this pricing model about three years ago. And yeah, it's, it's actually been really great. Like some, I'd say some customers don't like the fact that our pricing is pegged to their revenue. And they're like, well, why should we pay more if our, if our revenue goes up? But it, 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 pricing is always a bit of a compromise, right? It, it's like, but we, we initially started on volume. So how many subscribers you have. Um, that's how more subscribers, you have to pay us more money. Less subscribers, you have to pay us less money. The problem there is that you have some businesses that have you know, 10 subscribers and they're paying them crazy amounts of money. Their revenue is extremely high and our product is well, then extremely cheap for them. Uh, and maybe that's fair, but then you have a high volume subscription business, maybe 100,000 customers paying them a dollar so they're not making much money, but they have huge volumes. So they can't really afford our product. So it's this kind of disconnect between what companies can afford and how big a company is and their ability to pay in our, in our pricing model. So we found that revenue based pegging it to the revenue was kind of the fairest uh, way where we didn't have to, you know, uh, do any discounting. We basically stopped discounting our product completely now, which is really just helps helps everything you know kind of keep things simple at the business so if all the customers just kind of pay the same amount yeah i, I think uh this this business model has been has been good i think for us and, and for the customers and uh you know keeps things kind of fair and uh you know 0.25 percent of revenue is, is obviously like it's something but it's it's pretty small like most billing systems might charge one percent or 1.25 percent of revenue so we feel for the subscription data platform the data side it's like a pretty good deal to charge um, what we charge and it's good value for money. And of course, once you do get to those larger revenue bands, like 5 million plus ARR, then we can, we can do a sort of flat, you know, flat annual, we can negotiate kind of tiered pricing or something custom for that. So, yeah. Yeah. So just for everyone listening, I will make sure that we, um, you know, chart mobile is relatively easy to find, but I will also add a link uh, into the show notes for anyone that does want to sign up, um, especially if they're under the 10 K tier and, and you can use it for free. Um, Nick, one of the things that you just sort of mentioned on, on that, you know, I, in my conversations with founders, like I think getting pricing right is one of the things that's really, really difficult, especially at the start. And there's naturally an evolution of that, um, especially when you're making a big change, you know, out of, I guess, kind of industry practice against what people are generally used to, which is having to pay based on user and then doing it yeah. based on revenue. As you mentioned, you know, it seems fair, but you can't keep everyone happy. Um, do you have any advice to founders who are sort of making those types of changes, whether it comes to pricing or, or other sort of areas of their business in terms of how to get buy-in from, from their customers or how to sort of roll out significant changes like that without disrupting the, the business and the customers too much? Yeah, I mean, I think if you can do user-based pricing, you should. Um, the issue is that only really works for workflow software, right? Like if you're a workflow application, like a Zendesk where it's customer service agents or uh, sales sales reps in a, in a CRM, then it's like workflow software and charging per employee. And it just it's just much easier for the customer to think about, yeah, okay, we're gonna hire one salesperson, they're gonna be paid this amount of money. And of course, we're gonna have to pay an extra $50 or $100 a month for their CRM license. And if, if, if that employee leaves, then we'll just cancel that license and we'll, we won't pay that money anymore. And, and that, that business model, you know, that's kind of aligned with the company spending, uh, you know, they, they hire someone, they have to pay an extra license that kind of like makes sense. Right. And so I think if you can do seat based pricing, you totally should um, because I think they just get less objection, less objections. I think with, with things that generally need to price with, with chart model, it's not quite workflow software in that same way that, you know, obviously companies do build workflows using our software, but it isn't like software where you go in as a support agent and you do your day's work inside of chart mogul and then you go home, you know, it's not like that. So we, you know, if we start started charging on the user-based pricing, you know, 
there'd be just a big incentive for people to share a login and things like that because there isn't much that, that's going to change uh you know what i mean and mm. you know, it's not you're not going to lose much from doing that at zendesk you know if you if everybody logged into the same agent you wouldn't know which agent was performing better than others although from my memory of being there people did do that <laughs> <laughs> there's always a workaround right? fine workaround they were yeah. tagged they would tag the tickets with the name of the uh uh you know of the person who did it even though they all logged in with the same thing anyway it's kind of funny but they, that's kind of it's easy to detect as well um uh you know but that's that's kind of funny there's always workarounds but most people they want to just use the software how it's supposed to be used um so yeah i think yeah with when it's when you need to price on volume like an api based type of product it's always tricky you know amazon's pricing is super complex we, we recently moved to aws from my previous host and it's like you know, we're trying to figure out, okay, why do we just pay $30,000 on that? You know, like, what is that? <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> and Datadog also were like, great product. But last month, the bill was just like, whoa, what happened there? And like, okay, well, we were doing some extra logging somewhere and suddenly it spikes and it's more than, you know, more than $10,000 on something. So I think um, you got to, yeah, we don't do that. It's, 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 it's more predictable. It's pegged in that way. But yeah, pricing tough is really tough. I think, uh, it's really hard and, and just try and think about the customer. But if, you know, you can't also, you know, if you originally priced your, some people say that you should grandfather forever. You should always grandfather forever. And that's the thing you should do. I disagree with this. We, we have, we did, we did de grandfather some customers about two years, two or three, about three years ago or something. We, we kind of began that process. Um, and, you know, I think, I think if you started your, when we first started, we had a plan that was just a dollar a month. And then we had another plan that was $35 a month and things like that. You know, it's like from six, six, seven years ago. So I think, do, do you have to offer that forever? I don't think so. I think there's a way to say, hey guys, like a lot's changed since then. Our prices have been updated since then. Everybody else who's joined in the last few years has is paying the new price. You guys are still paying the old price. So let's, mm -hmm. um, you know, let's make a, a transition plan to get you guys to be you know paying something more in line with what everyone else is paying but you know don't just jump <laughs> suddenly do it overnight you're going to give them some runway give them some warning and, and figure it out so that it has it has to be a kind of you know a two-way a two-way thing i guess in a way for pricing Nick, mindful of the time, and I know that I can kind of talk to you for the rest of the afternoon, um, but I'm just going to sort of limit to, limit it to it, the last few questions that I have. And one is, you know, especially from, you know, the vast majority, I think about 68% of uh, the listeners of the podcast are based in Australia. And from an Australian context, whenever we sort of think about global expansion, the first and most obvious market for us is the US. And, you know, especially kind of thinking about sort of setting up teams and, um, you know, having people on the ground there is really important. Uh, I think that the really interesting thing about ChartMogul, and again, you touched on this a little bit earlier, is that, you know, you have a, a globally distributed team. You've got three main offices across Berlin, Canada, Toronto, I believe, and Korea as well. You know, how, like when you think about sort of global expansion or sort of setting out um, the team and offices, what was the approach that you took and, you know, why those three particular locations over sort of other uh, more traditional um, markets or, or kind of places where founders would think about setting up? I think these decisions are usually made for personal reasons where you put things. I know at Zendesk, you know, we we had a Melbourne office for Australia and New Zealand. That, you know, that was to do with one of the executives, you know, lived there. We opened an office in Manila for Zendesk. That was because I decided to open an office. You know, I, I decided to go there and do that. Um, and, I, you know, why was I there? Because visiting a a friend of mine from Germany who was living there. And, you know, so a lot of these things that kind of happen for, for personal reasons, a lot more than, you know, people think, I, I think you know, this is usually not analysis on like, unless you're, unless you're going into that market to sell domestically to that market. Like, of course, if you want to sell to the Japanese market, you should open an office in probably in Tokyo, which is what we did at Sandesk. And that makes total sense. For chart mogul, our offices are usually about, the work is usually virtual in a way. So Berlin was mostly about personal reasons, like where would we like to, to kind of have a base? We like Berlin. 
and it's startup friendly and it's you know not too expensive in terms of housing and these things and so it's mostly personal reasons why we decided to start there but also there's some kind of benefits around easy to easy immigration policy they're quite open in terms of the visa policies things like that toronto was was also similar like similarly random in that we we chart moguls always had about 55 percent of our revenues from the us so the us obviously has different time zone than Berlin. So you want to support and a different culture and these things. And you kind of want to support the US and Canadian market with local talent, right? Like with people in the right time zone and, uh, you know, salespeople in the right time zone and support and success, customer success people in the right time zone. And, you know, this is, this is probably 2016, 2015, 2016, but I, at that time we couldn't afford to hire people in New York or San Francisco, basically. It's like those, those places are very expensive. It doesn't make sense to hire support people. Uh, there so it's like well let's look at that you know let's put some job ads online let's try and line up some interviews so i lined up two interviews in austin texas i heard austin texas was a good tech hub and not as expensive as the coastal cities and i lined up two interviews in toronto and so i flew to toronto i met the two folks uh, or three two or three folks that, that had made our shortlist and i flew to flew down to texas i met i went to austin i, I met the uh two or three people that had made the shortlist for our interview to be kind of sales and support. And I think we made a couple of job off, two or three job offers out of that. And the, the people in uh, Toronto accepted <laughs> the people in, uh, I think, I think one of the people in Texas kind of half accepted, but they didn't want to leave their job. They just kind of wanted to do it part-time. They're like, yeah, I want to see where this goes. And like, ah, kind of looking for people to jump in here. And so we, we ended up yeah, hiring a couple of people in Toronto and incorporating, you know, a few months later, I think we initially hired them on consulting contracts, but, uh, you know, a bit later we, we incorporated a chart mobile Canada technology, Canada limited or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is and, and, and started hiring. And now we have about, I don't know, maybe 10 people in, in Canada. So it's really just random. It's like, because then the next people we, you know, we hired someone from, from you know, then I think they, they, they knew they had a friend and then we, we hired someone from, from the Microsoft store, like, like the Apple store, they also have Microsoft store. And she had a friend who was there, another friend who was there. So it's kind of, it kind of grows from that. And yeah, we ended up just kind of snowballing and we ended up with a Canadian office with like eight to 10 people uh, there maybe more. Um, <laughs> so that was also kind of random. And here, Seoul, it's also kind of, we had a couple of Koreans in the company. It's also kind of personal reasons for myself to, to be here, you know, so uh, now we have like six, six people here as well, but we don't, you know, we don't really sell much in Korea. We have a few customers, but we're really doing like design here, development here and things like that. Yeah. So I think we, we could really be anywhere. I mean, our, you know, it's, it's mostly around time zone and talent. Like our offices are around, okay, where can we attract talent and what, what are the right time zones to be in versus, you know, we need to be on the ground so we can go meet with customers. That's, that's not really the reason. Yeah. I, I mean, um, you know, obviously it, it sounds like you've kind of taken that sort of distributed approach from day one with, with Chartmogul. I may be wrong, but, um, you know, especially considering the effects of COVID, you know, in Australia, uh, as I saw you kind of tweeted as well, we have fairly severe restrictions on on travel and all of those sort of things in terms of getting both in and out of the country. You know, from your perspective, how how important is it or how has, you know, everything that's happened with COVID over the last sort of 18 months to two years changed the way that you sort of think about the importance of having people based in particular locations or how you sort of set up and structure the team? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we were mostly in Berlin back in 2018 with a with about half, maybe 40% of people remote. And then we decided that we should convert to fully remote. And even though we still have an office, we'll, tr we'll start to behave as if we're fully remote. So we'll log into Zoom calls independently, even if we're in the same building, et cetera. So we converted in 2018 to be fully remote. I, I moved to Korea in early 2019, you know, and, and the team started to, we started to hire people basically anywhere. Not quite sure for certain, for certain roles, we, we kind of have some restrictions. Like if people need production access, we, we generally hire only in, in um, you know, the, e, the EU and, and Canada for, for those roles um, and Korea now. Um, so, you know, we, we don't, we have some kind of security and, and, and some compliance security stuff around location wise, where we'll hire people, some people for certain roles, but yeah, like COVID, COVID hit right, like nearly two years ago now. And so we'd already actually made that transition to remote, to being fully 
acting and behaving as a fully remote company before COVID hit. So we were quite lucky there and that we didn't really have to, nothing really had to change day one of COVID. I think the hardest part has been just people, you know, we kind of, some of the negatives of remote is obviously like isolation and like people don't, people like to sometimes go to an office and, and meet meet people for lunch, you know, go, go out with colleagues for lunch or dinner or something like that. Right. So we kind of used to get around that by doing offsites and meeting up and going to conferences together and converging in different places. So that we haven't been able to do a lot of that stuff for the last year and a half. And that's, that's been hard on people. So we're pretty excited to get back to doing, I'm going next week to California, fingers crossed, uh, you know, <laughs> that all goes well to, to go to SASTA conference. And like, literally, I think 11 of us are going there from chart mogul. So that's going to be, that's going to be awesome. And then we, we're doing a work from Berlin week in, in November where, you know, if you can, if you're vaccinated, you can get to Berlin and you're, you know, all this stuff, you can go work in Berlin for a week and, and we're going to do it. We, we've had to obviously cancel our whole company off sites for the last couple of years, last year or so, but we're going to, I think we're aiming for February now, I believe for our first post COVID full company off sites. I think that that's important that people can, can, can kind of have a sense of community from their, from their work because remote, yeah. I think fully remote without the opportunity to actually meet up is, is not ideal either. <laughs> yeah. 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 And fingers crossed we can all get back to a stage where, you know, even just you mentioning travel just seems so far away for us in, in Australia at the moment, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get back to a stage where, uh, you know, we can all sort of start meeting together as teams for proper teams. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. I mean, different countries had different things. I mean, Korea actually started off being one of the most effective responders to the pandemic and that we've never had a lockdown really here never, oh. never anything like that but there's a lot of technology tracing and the, you know private the people in the west wouldn't like in terms of privacy <laughs> <laughs> got tracking everywhere you go and uh but you know they were also a bit behind with the um the vaccine rollout so i i, I finally just just got vaccinated fully vaccinated just 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 very recently so I, i've been watching people back home in England where I'm from like we're slightly this year slightly jealous like damn they're actually able to do all these different things and we we still we still although there's not lockdown there's a bunch of restrictions and like you can only meet like two people and everything closes by nine oh, now it's 10 p.m it was 9 p.m and only two people can you know meet up to get you know out after 6 p.m and like there's all these different things um we've had and i was kind of watching jealously england but then last year england was watching me you know my family mm. <laughs> me in korea basically kind of like a mess stuck at home you know so uh uh yeah it's yeah, a weird, it's been a weird uh, <laughs> couple of years, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, hopefully we're all, uh, you know, with vaccination rates going up, hopefully we're all uh, sort of starting to come around the other side of that. Fingers crossed. Anyways, Nick, I know we've gone well over time. So I've just got my last last sort of question for you as well, which I, I thought was a, a really interesting thing or, or, or something that I haven't really sort of heard before. But from what I understand, even despite you sort of having 57 uh, people in your team now, you, alongside being the CEO, are also the head of product. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just, you know, again, really, uh, you know, and I think that you've mentioned that you have sort of heads off pretty much every other area of the business as well. I guess, strategically, how important has that been for you to sort of retain that, you know, really strong alignment on on the product side? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so in the past, we have had one or two people to help run product. Um, But yeah, this, for the last couple of years, or two and a half years, I've I've just fully ran the, the product team directly. And I have four PMs reporting to me. And there's another PM who reports to one of them. So it's five PMs, basically. And then I, I run that. I oversee that team. I don't do the, I don't, I rarely specking any product features or changes myself, but I am reviewing. I'm meeting with the product team like once a week and I'm working, going back and forward, doing one on ones with them. And I'm, I'm reviewing the specification documents and, and these things quite, quite closely. I think that's fine. I mean, we are, we are we're a software products company. Like we, hundred percent of our revenues come from people buying our product, and you know I think uh, as the our product is, is a little bit what we live or die by. Obviously, we have to have great sales, we have to have great marketing, we have to have great support, and yeah, we do have heads of we have a head of engineering, we have head of success, head of support, head of finance operations, head of sales, head of marketing, all these things. But yeah, I just I just feel like. Um, that's where I can add the most value, I guess, is, uh, you know, 
if and when we do, yeah, we can find someone to 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 do that. Maybe that makes sense. I, I enjoy it as well. I enjoy being involved in product. I like it, and I think I add the most value there. So um, I just keep doing it. So <laughs> I mean, partly being a founder or CEO, you can kind of choose like you you can you can you can decide to try and fire yourself from every job, right? So you don't you're not involved in anything, and you just kind of. Or you can keep hold of the, some of the things you like, you know, so it's kind of up to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think, I think I enjoy that and I add the most value in products. So I, I, I still, I still run it, but the team also know what they're doing. So they don't need me as that much to, to kind of, kind of make progress. On that note, and speaking of adding value, Nick, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show and adding a ton of value uh, for, for this podcast and for our listeners through this particular episode. For anyone that wants to find out more about you or, or find out more about ChartMogul, what's the best way for them to do that? I guess our website, chartmogul.com and uh, Twitter for me, uh, Nick underscore Franklin is my Twitter handle. I'm on there every single day. It's a sort of semi-healthy slash semi-unhealthy addiction life. I've developed as <laughs> Twitter. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know for, for better or worse. So I'm, I'm on there all the time. If you, if you s- send me a message or at me, I'll, I'll totally see it very quickly. So, yeah. Perfect. I will make sure all of those links are in the show notes. Nick, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thanks for having me, Roy. Yeah. Have a great one. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to episode 154 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back next week with another episode. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.